wanted. Good plain cook to perform domestic duties for artistic household. Broad outlook essential. Apply Mrs E Steinberg. It was the third time since breakfast that Kitty had read the notice she'd cut from the Herald. Folding a slip of paper back into the pocket of her raincoat, she walked along the slippery grass verge towards her interview at Willow Cottage. Beneath her blue beret, the ends of her hair were beginning to kink in the mist of spring drizzle. She'd heard that the cottage was now in the ownership of an American woman, and she lived with a man who was apparently a poet. Not that you think it to look at him, he was quite young and didn't have a beard. It wasn't clear if the poet was the American woman's husband or not. Through the dripping beech hedge, she caught glimpses of the place. It was red brick and had exposed beams, like many in the village. But the front door was crimson, with a long stained glass panel, much brighter and swirlier than anything Kitty had seen in church, and obviously new. As she walked around to the back of the house, there was a series of high yaps. Don't mind Blotto; he gets excited with strangers. A tall girl of about twelve stood in the doorway, chewing a piece of her long blonde hair. Who are you, and why didn't you knock on the front door? I've come about the position, Miss. Position? Is your mother is Madame in? Who? Madame, uh, Mrs. Steinberg, Miss. The girl frowned and chewed. She was wearing a very short and ill-fitting tulle skirt with an orange cardigan. Have I come to the right place? I don't know. Rain was dripping into Kitty's collar now. Perhaps I'd better be going. The girl stared at Kitty for a moment. Her eyes were startlingly blue. She kissed the dog on his nose and was licked right up her forehead. My name is Regina, but that's horrible. So everyone calls me Jeanie, and this is Blotto. I think I've made a mistake. Jeanie, who's there? So she was American. A tall woman came to the door. She was wearing an embroidered red jacket and wide-legged mauve slacks. Her hair waved above her high forehead and was the colour of brown bread. Her nose was huge. The end of it looked like a large radish. She blinked at Kitty. What's your name, please? Allen, Madam.、Uh, Kate.、Uh, Kitty Allen. I've come about the position. I'm Allen Steinberg. Do come in. You'll have to excuse my daughter. I'm afraid she's always been highly strung. There was no fire in the sitting room grate. Ashes floated in the air as Mrs. Steinberg walked past the enormous fireplace, dropped into a velvet armchair, and drew a fur rug across her knees.、Oh, take a seat, please, Kitty. Above the armchair where Mrs. Steinberg was sitting, Kitty noticed a hole in the wall. It was as big as the woman's head, and its edges were ragged. On the mantelpiece was a large bunch of grass stuffed into a blue ceramic jug. Mister Crane loves grass," said Missus Steinberg. "He's worked wonders with this place. He's an absolute whiz with interiors. We're both very keen on modernization. I hope you like music." "Yes, madam," said Kitty, wondering what music had to do with anything. "Excellent. How old are you, Kitty?" "Nineteen, madam." So tell me, what can you cook? Meat and vegetables, both, madam.、Uh, savouries and sweets. Mrs. Steinberg seemed to be waiting for more. I can do meat cakes, beef, olives, faggots, and castle pudding, bread and butter pudding, and all of that. Puddings are what I do best, madam. Mrs. Steinberg's face was blank. Anything else? Perhaps they were vegetarians,、uh, fruit fritters, and、um, nothing more. Continental, Kitty. I can do cheese puffs, Madam. Mrs. Steinberg laughed. <laughs> Stop calling me that. It makes me sound like a brothel keeper. You can call me Mrs. Steinberg. Now, would you like to ask me anything? Anything at all, Kitty? Are there any other staff here, Mrs. Steinberg? Just Arthur, the gardener. He's here most days. Are we settled then? Could you start next week? What I mean is. What will I be doing exactly, Kitty? I am probably the only Bohemian in the country who likes order. 
Let's see, a little cleaning and polishing, fires swept and laid when it's cold, which it is all the damn time, isn't it? It will be easier for you when Mr. Crane and Arthur have finished knocking these two rooms together, of course. And there's the cooking, of course, but we quite often have a cold plate for lunch, and only two courses for dinner, unless we've got company. And we don't go in for any fuss at breakfast time, either. Toast will do for me, but Mr. Crane does like his porridge. Kitty blinked. He has a little writing studio in the garden, but if you'll take my advice, you won't go in there. He hates to be disturbed. He's a poet, but at the moment he's working on a novel. Here she paused and smiled so brilliantly that Kitty had to smile back. I'm encouraging him all I can. That's why he's living here, you see. So, can you start next week? As she nodded, Kitty's stomach gave a long, loud rumble. Kitty, I think he'll do nicely. Forty pounds a year and two afternoons off a week, all right. Thank you, Mrs. Steinberg. Mrs. Steinberg had been very generous, Kitty reminded herself as she looked around her new room. Forty pounds a year was more than she'd ever been paid before. And the room wasn't bad, either. There was even a wardrobe, so Kitty didn't have to hang her clothes on the back of the door. Mrs. Steinberg had said they would like lunch at half-past twelve. She hadn't said what they would like for lunch, or how Kitty was to prepare it. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Jeanie loomed in the doorway. She was wearing a white robe, and her large eyes were rimmed with black coal. What's for lunch today? Kitty stared at the girl, trying to make sense of her appearance. The girl stared back. I don't know, miss. Why wasn't that girl at school? There was another knock at the door. Before she could answer, Mrs. Steinberg was standing on the rug. What are you doing here? she asked Jeanie. The girl didn't reply. I suggest you stop bothering the cook. She's got a lot to get on with. She pulled her daughter up by the arm. Jeanie dangled before Kitty, her feet hardly touching the floor. May I show you to Mr. Crane before lunch, Kitty? He's got a gap in his riding schedule and has asked to meet you. The riding studio, said Mrs. Steinberg, opening the door to the little house at the bottom of the garden. Kitty, this is Mr. Crane. The room smelled of flowers, gas, and dog. Beneath the window there was a desk strewn with papers and an old typewriter. He was tall, and his nose was long and straight, but his left eye drooped a bit, making his face seem slightly lopsided. Kitty's going to be our new help, George. She's a plain cook, and she has a broad outlook. I've told her there's no need to come in here. He hates to be disturbed. Don't you, George? Mr. Crane didn't reply. He was still looking at Kitty, particularly if he's reading Karl Marx. Mr. Crane gave a short laugh. Welcome to Willow Cottage, Kitty. I hope you'll be happy here. Thank you, sir. She bobbed. Then, without meaning to, her knees bent and she cast her eyes to the floor. He touched her elbow as she came back up. Don't, he said, don't do that. There's really no earthly need ever to do that. And please, don't call me sir. She looked at the place where his long fingers had been on her arm. Please, you can call me Mr. Crane, said Mrs. Steinberg, showing Kitty the door. The kitchen smelled of coffee and Brotto, who was snoozing under the large table. Jeanie skipped ahead and sat at the table to watch with her blackened eyes. Excuse me, miss, but don't you go to school? asked Kitty. The girl shook her head. George says he could teach me at home, but Ellen says he should be working on his book. What are we having for lunch? Kitty walked to the larder. Perhaps it would become clear what she was to prepare once she was inside. On the shelves there were at least a dozen bottles of oil, all with labels that seemed to be in French. There were jars of lobster and cockle paste. In the refrigerator a dozen eggs, but no cheese. Can I have an omelette? Kitty could scramble, poach, and boil eggs with confidence, but her omelettes were always flat. What else could she make? She took a step back into the kitchen and almost walked into him. Sorry to start you, the man said, looking her up and down. There was a clicking sound as he rolled whatever was in his mouth from one side to the other, making his neatly trimmed moustache twitch. Oh, you do the garden and that. Mrs. S asked me to fetch you these. He brought a bunch of carrots from behind his back. 
His hands were large and tanned. She said something about soup. Kitty looked at the earthy trailing ends of the vegetables. She sat at the table and pressed her hands to her mouth. Crying was not what a new cook should do on her first day. Sorry, she said. I'm not quite... She took a breath. I am Kitty. Arthur. <laughs> what are they like? She asked, being careful not to look at him too closely. Mr. Crane and Mrs. Ass. He spilled his tea around the cup. Well, he's a bit wet. She's all right. A girl before you didn't last long. There was a silence. Arthur looked at the clock. Leave you to it then, he said, disappearing into the garage. Kitty stood for a moment, staring after him. It would have to be omelettes. They would have to be flat. All week, Kitty longed for her bath. When Friday night finally came, she waited until nine, when Jeanie was in bed and Mrs Steinberg and Mr Crane were in the sitting room together. The bath was huge, with gnarled claw feet and creaking bath taps which squealed as she twisted them. The geezer choked. It would take at least ten minutes to even half fill the tub. Unbuttoning her frock, she glimpsed her reflection in the full-length mirror which stood in the corner of the room. Kitty had yet to look at the whole of herself in that glass. It was the first full-length mirror she'd been confronted by. It was strange how it all connected up. All the parts of herself she'd often thought separate. Thighs to bottom, stomach to chest to neck and arms. She blushed at herself, then giggled, leaning forward and putting her hand to her mouth so the tips of her breasts shook. She felt them beneath her arm, swaying. Taking her hand away, she saw her nipple turn brown and wrinkled like a walnut. Was it normal for flesh to move on its own accord like that? She stepped into the bath quickly so as not to catch sight of herself again. She could hear music coming from the sitting room, and she began to rock back and forth, the water rippling over her hands and thighs and backside as she pushed herself along the bottom of the bath. It was like the time she'd gone to Bognor Regis on the Sunday school outing and had spent hours letting the tide wash her up and down the sand. She closed her eyes as she listened to the music. Were they dancing together? Kitty herself had danced with a man only once. He was called Frank. Her sister had introduced them. It was at the drill hall. All night she'd felt she was pushing against his steps because he kept getting them wrong. He would keep standing on her feet when she'd polished her shoes specially, and he wasn't the lightest of men. Eventually, he barked, You're leading! And she'd apologised over and over again, but he said, oh, For Christ's sake, what's the matter with you? She'd run from the dance floor without her coat and hat, and he hadn't come after her. Not all men would be like that. Dancing with Arthur would be different. Arthur left his boots at the door before walking on her kitchen floor. He rinsed out his own cup after tea. But dancing with Arthur would be nothing like dancing with Mr Crane. Although Willow seemed to Kitty a large cottage, the corridors were narrow. In the downstairs hallway, she had to turn sideways to get from the kitchen to the sitting room with the tray. It wasn't much better upstairs. By far the easiest way to fold sheets, as Kitty was doing now, was to hang them over the banister like sails and gather the corners together, tucking the sheet under her chin and widening her arms to their furthest stretch as she did so. Kitty had just got the last sheet tucked into a decent shape when Mrs Steinberg called her name. She hadn't realised anyone else was upstairs. At this time in the afternoon, Mrs Steinberg was usually in the library. Kitty, I'm in the bedroom. Can you come in? What was she doing in there at this time of day? A cold queasiness crawled through Kitty's stomach. She had a sudden vision of Mrs Steinberg in bed with Mr Crane, both of them sitting up, naked to the waist. Kitty, that is you out there. 
Mrs. Steinberg's breasts would probably be quite flat and long, what with childbearing and three husbands, if you counted Mr. Crane and the last man, who no one ever talked about except the girl. Jimmy, that was his name. Kitty? Kitty's mouth jolted into a smile. Uh, what is it, Mrs. Steinberg? Come in here. That woman's voice had metal in it. I'm just folding the sheets. Damn it, why won't you come in here? She took a step forward to the edge of the bed, where Mrs. Steinberg was sitting, fully clothed, holding a handkerchief in one hand. Her eyes were slightly pink, and there was no smile, and no Mr. Crane. Sit with me, Kitty. There was a notebook and a cardboard folder on the bed, full of what appeared to be letters. Mrs. Steinberg placed her long fingers on Kitty's arm. I'd like to ask your advice. Kitty couldn't remember anyone asking her advice before. Looking at Mrs. Steinberg, she saw blotches of freckle the colour of toffee covering her large nose, and her orange lipstick had dried out around the edges of her mouth. I hope you don't mind me speaking frankly to you, Kitty. As no doubt you've gathered, I've lived a rather strange life. I've had so much fun, and I've seen lots of things. And I've tried to learn. Kitty wished this conversation were taking place somewhere else, somewhere away from the bed where Mrs. Steinberg had relations with Mr. Crane. And I've always chosen men who might teach me something, if you know what I mean. But I've never been very good on the domestic side of things. There was a pause. Kitty filled it by nodding. So you agree? Agree with what, Mrs. Steinberg? Oh, never mind. She pressed her fingers into Kitty's shoulder. I'd like you to help me become a domesticated woman. Domesticated? Kitty hadn't thought of herself as particularly domesticated. Before she came here, she'd never made even rough puff pastry. You see, the thing with Mr. Crane is that he's really rather old-fashioned, despite all his communist sympathies, and I think that's what he'd really like me to do, in his heart of hearts, become a housewife, a really good one. His own mother's an absolute angel, and he adores you, of course, Kitty. Kitty felt a heat rise up her throat and spread across her cheeks. You must have noticed it. I have. He really admires the work you do for us. You've taken it all on, the cooking, the cleaning, the domestic science, with such a plum. The metal had returned to her voice. Thank you, Mrs. Steinberg. So all I'm asking is that you show me, Kitty. Show me how to keep house. When you're ready, you could give me a few lessons in cookery. She paused. And from now on, this is the beginning of my life as a true wife and mother. Kitty smiled back, wondering what the woman had thought herself to be up to this moment. George's daughter, Diana, arrived to stay in time for lunch. She was even prettier than Kitty had expected. Her black hair shone like wet stone, and her eyelashes were as thick as a doll's. Diana forked up her luncheon meat salad with one hand. Unlike Jeanie, who scattered crumbs and left mounds of lettuce untouched, Diana ate everything and left the plate clean. Then she went on to tackle Kitty's apple pie, using her spoon like a knife to cut the pudding into even chunks before slowly chewing each piece. Look at that, said Ellen. A good appetite, even for Kitty's food. Can we play now? asked Jeanie. Why not? Games are so much more interesting than food. The girls scraped back their chairs and ran upstairs. When they reached the landing, Jeanie said, This is my room, and that's Ellen's, and that one will be yours. Aren't there any other rooms? asked Diana. Only downstairs. Hasn't your mother got an awful lot of money? I think so, yes. Then why hasn't she got a bigger house? The question had never occurred to Jeanie, who'd lived in all sorts of houses, big and small, all over Europe. I don't know. Does she like it here? Not much. Diana shrugged. 
Let's dress up, she said. Jeanie pulled the dressing up things from the bottom of her wardrobe. There was a white Egyptian robe with gold trim in the Tutankhamun style, which Ellen had bought on her honeymoon, and a huge hooped petticoat, which had been Ellen's when she was a little girl in New York. Diana heaved a sable coat from the heap and hung it from her head like a hooded cape. Mm, this smells like a dead animal. That's because it is a dead animal, said Jeanie, throwing herself back on her bed. It was Jimmy's. Who's Jimmy? He lived with us for ages after my father left. I don't remember my father, but I remember everything about Jimmy. He was a true bohemian. He wore it on car journeys. He drove from our house in Paris to Nice in one go. Where is he now? Jeanie sat up. He's dead. Diana pulled the fur coat tighter around her and said nothing. Ellen had had a drink, just one, just a gin and it, and wandered outside into the warm evening. Only half an hour until supper. Soon she'd be preparing it herself, of course. Something light and fresh and French. But for now, Kitty was perspiring over another roasted piece of pig. She hovered in the doorway of Crane's studio, smiling. She knew she shouldn't be here when he was trying to work. You're not riding. Without looking at her, Crane stretched back in his chair and sighed. <sighs> Reading. Reading what? She was through the door now, putting her hands on the desk beside him. Crane rose from his chair. Marx. Of course. Do you object? I never object to reading, you know that. But sometimes there are better things to do. Like what, Ellen? Like writing. He moved closer to her. She closed her eyes. You've never kissed me in here. Reaching past her, he ripped the sheet of paper from his typewriter. He paused to plant a light kiss on her cheek. Then he folded the paper and put it in his pocket. What was that? Writing, he said or as close to writing as I've got today. Is it your novel? He dropped into his armchair. I don't have a novel, Ellen. Yes, you do. You told me. He'd said to her when they first came here, you make me want to write stories again. And she'd imagined herself in the pages of his book, The Exciting Foreign Vamp. Am I the woman in your book? She'd ask knowingly. How could she not appear in his book? After all, she'd given him. What was the point in coming here and giving up your job at the publishing house if you're not writing? Eventually, he dropped his eyes and said in a quiet voice, It was for you. She wished she had a cigarette so she could exhale scornfully. I gave it up for you, he continued, swallowing. Had you forgotten... I've bought you something, she said. She hadn't, but it was good to change the subject. She'd been thinking about buying him another typewriter, a newer one. I wish you'd stop. His voice was still quiet, but steady. Start what? Buying things for me. Don't you like things? Well, I... You used to like things. New books, pens, that cashmere coat. You liked them. Of course I liked them. I loved them. It's just... She'd bought him a silk tie. That was the first thing. He'd looked pleased, but had never worn it. Bottles of whiskey didn't go down well either. And there was the MG, of course. She'd had to nag him to take it out of the drive the other day. Look, I don't want to fight, he said, his mouth working in a way she recognised. He was trying to make himself smile. It was how he always avoided a row. Isn't it almost time for supper? Another piece of pig, she pulled her face. He grinned a little then, his lopsided eyes creasing. Well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. It's going to change soon, though. She hadn't meant to tell him, but he would push her to these things, these declarations. Things are going to change. I'm going to be cooking and looking after the girls. I need something to do out here, don't I? She felt the blood rising to her face. 
You're keen on the importance of work and workers, darling, aren't you? Earning your place in the world and all that, I'm going to earn mine. He leant forward in his chair and opened his mouth to speak, but she cut him off. It's going to be wonderful, George. I'm going to be a domesticated woman. Can you imagine? Kitty's going to help me. She should have had another gin in it before she started this, but it was too late to stop now. Uh, well, that sounds uh, intriguing. All I need is another baby, and then I will be quite the little housewife. Now he was staring at her, his mouth open. Uh, don't worry, darling, it won't hurt. Well, it won't hurt you anyway. Ellen. His voice had lowered. It was the tone she'd heard him use when Diana said something out of place. Are you... Uh, are you serious? She knelt by the side of his armchair and looked up at him. She waited for a while, hoping he would meet her gaze. But his eyes seemed fixed on his own knees. So she said, Yes, I am. Don't you want us to have a child, George? Well, I, I suppose we've always said that we came here to be a family together. But uh, the thing is, I am still married to Lillian, officially, and Ellen jumped up. <laughs> what difference does that make? You live here with me. We're already a family, you and Diana, me and Jeannie. He closed his eyes. He seemed to be counting breaths. She really should have had another gin. She managed to keep her voice steady, but it was a great effort. You'll think about it, darling. With his eyes closed, he nodded and took her head in his hands and kissed her so hard it was all she could do not to flinch. Kitty was on her way downstairs to clear away the breakfast things, having finished sweeping the landing, when she heard the sound and noticed Mrs Steinberg's bedroom door was ajar. The blood seemed to thicken and slow in her veins as she stood in the gloom of the landing, holding her broom and watching Mr Crane dressing. He was standing with his back to her, looking at himself in the mirror, his green shirt in his hand. He was naked to the waist. His shoulders were wider than they appeared when they were clothed, and at the very bottom of his back there was what looked like a large dimple, an indent of pale flesh just above where his braces hung down to his thighs. A soft place. As he moved to slip an arm into a sleeve, the muscle on his shoulder jumped and stretched. Kitty realised she was holding her breath. His eyes shifted then, and Kitty was sure he'd noticed her reflection in the mirror, the shadow of a girl in an apron, her hair unwashed since Friday, spying on him. She found that she could not avert her gaze, and for a second it seemed as though they were staring directly at each other in the mirror. At last she managed to move. She walked downstairs as quickly and quietly as she could, clutching the soft broom to her chest. The gardener, Arthur, turned his plate around, watching the cake as if it might make a sudden move. What's this, then? It's a French bun. Is it now? She'd made them yesterday, for Mr Crane's tea. Arthur had the one that was left over. He took a bite, then went back to reading his western, glancing towards her just once to nod his approval. His eyes were narrowed but bright. She noticed that they had specks of yellow in them. She turned to the sink. When she looked towards him again, he was staring straight at her. Her eyes remained steady, and a moment of silence passed before he said, What I wondered was, Yes? About dancing. Dancing? Her voice came out shrill. I can't dance, you know. He gave a little laugh. You might not think it to look at me. Kitty put a hand to her hair. Oh, I didn't mean... Well, I just want you to know. If you think you'd like to... His forehead was shining with perspiration. 
She found herself smiling. All right, then. He let out a breath. Friday. She nodded once, quickly. It was going to be a perfect evening, Ellen thought. She'd asked Kitty for coco vin, and the results hadn't been bad. The bird was a little stringy, but it had complemented the Beaujolais well. She changed, too, into her long cream silk with the draped sleeves. She didn't usually bother dressing for dinner, but after she'd blurted out to George the thing about wanting a baby with him, she felt she should make an effort. As if to avoid any mention of the subject over dinner, he'd lectured them on the three million unemployed, telling the girls how lucky they were to be living here rather than in one of the distressed areas of the country where the miners couldn't feed their families. Now the girls were in bed, and Ellen and Crane had retired to the sofa with a new bottle, she hoped to get him off politics. You really should join the party, Ellen, if you're uh, serious about things, you know. Not a good opening. But I'm not a worker or an intellectual, darling. They wouldn't have me. She held out the bottle to him, but he shook his head and placed his glass on the floor. I thought you were going to be a housewife. What of it? That's work, isn't it? Oh, Crane, she sighed. You really are a unique man. He smiled. So you'll do it, then? Laughing, she snatched the cushion from his hands and swiped him over the head, splashing his trousers with Beaujolais. If I do, what will you do for me? He wiped himself down, gave a theatrical sigh and looked towards the ceiling. Well, uh, let me see. We could see what I could uh, come up with. She grabbed his hand and pulled him to the door. Crane always insisted on going outside to feel the air before coming to bed. He was absolutely mad on fresh air. All the men she'd ever slept with were, even though they declared themselves intellectuals. She suddenly wondered what it would be like to sleep with a man who hated the outdoors, or a man for whom the outdoors was a place of work rather than worship. It's a beautiful night. Crane came into the room, smiling. The moon's beaming. Then she knew what she should do. Right now, jumping out of bed, she cried, Outside! Crane looked her up and down. But she was already on the landing, sprinting towards the stairs. The gravel path crackled beneath her. Kitty's window looked onto the garden, but she was no doubt fast asleep after grappling with that bird. The girl had looked quite worn out when she'd brought the plates through. Crane had advised her to get an early night, at which she'd blushed furiously. It was as if he'd suggested tucking her in bed himself. Leaning back on the gnarled trunk, Ellen untied her dressing gown. She closed her eyes and waited. To her relief, he stepped forward and kissed her. It was a dry, rather precise kiss. Twisting her arm between their two bodies, she began to unbutton him. But as she took him in her hand, she found he was still small and soft. George? She mustn't say anything, she suddenly realised. If she wanted this baby, she'd have to pretend it was her fault. Sorry, darling, it's just I'm feeling a bit cold. Shall we go inside, after all? Monday morning, Mrs. Steinberg and Kitty faced each other across the kitchen table. After some confusion over which button fastened to which strap, Mrs. Steinberg had finally got her apron on the right way round. What are we starting with, Kitty? I'm terribly excited about this, aren't you? Cutlets, Mrs. Steinberg. Between them was a pile of meat and a basin of breadcrumbs, which Kitty had risen at half-past six this morning to make. Cutlets? Mutton cutlets, Mrs. Steinberg, best end of neck. Kitty gestured towards the package on the table. Don't take this the wrong way, Kitty, dear. Mrs. Steinberg flashed a half-smile. But don't you think we could attempt something a little more, well, adventurous? What about something French, for example? Kitty made herself look back at her mistress. The woman's cheeks had a greyish tinge, and her eyes were a little bloodshot. I've got a book, Kitty ventured. She fetched Sylvester's sensible cookery from the shelf by the sink. Let me see. Mrs. Steinberg snatched the book, muttering under her breath. Oyster patties, oh, I mess with perfection. Beef a la mode, oh, not more beef. Cromesque of veal, have we any veal? 
Kitty shook her head. Right, well, it looks like it'll have to be cutlets then. Kitty looked at the clock. Half past eleven already, and no sign of Arthur. It would probably be better if he didn't come in for his morning tea today, what with the invitation to the dance still hanging in the air. She still wasn't sure why she'd said yes. Where shall we start? First we have to do the potatoes. What do we have to do with them? Peel them, Mrs. Steinberg. Right, yes. I, I can do it, though. The potatoes are in the shed. I'll get them. Before she could protest, the woman had disappeared. This was going to take even longer than she'd imagined. Look, said Mrs. Steinberg, I carried them in on my apron. Isn't that what you do? She tipped four small potatoes onto the table, scattering Kitty's shoes with dirt. Yes, that's what you do, only... What? We might need a few more for all of you. Oh, I hadn't thought. She looked so downcast that for a moment Kitty considered consoling her. But then, I know what we need. Music. Let's have some music. And once more she disappeared. Kitty carried the potatoes to the sink and began to scrub them clean, staring through the window at the writing studio as she rubbed at the dirt. George had opened and propped the door ajar, which was unusual. It must get warm in there in this sunshine. He'd have to take his jacket off and perhaps roll up his shirt sleeves. His bare wrists would be resting against the desk, rubbing against the white paper. I thought you might need these. Kitty dropped her potato. She hadn't heard Arthur come in. I tried to tell her she'd need more, but it was too late he said, standing close behind her and emptying a basin of potatoes into the sink. Muddy water splashed up her arms. There was the smell of aniseed, and his breath warmed her ear as he whispered, You will come, won't you, on Friday? She squeezed a clump of mud between her fingers. I... I've got to see about the time off. Ask her today, then. Now's a good time. Oh, Arthur, Duke Ellington or Glenn Gray, Mrs. Steinberg was leaning on the doorframe. Oh, Duke Ellington, definitely, Mrs. Steinberg. There were those yellow sparks in his eyes again, and he stroked at his moustache. I knew you'd be a fan of the Duke, Arthur. I just knew it. Best get on, said Arthur, opening the back door. Don't you love this one, Kitty? Mrs. Steinberg was clicking her fingers in time with the beat. Divine, hot and sweet. Kitty began to peel the potatoes while her mistress spun around the kitchen. I do up, do up, I do up, do up, da. I danced on the tabletops in the dome, you know, Kitty. That's in Paris. My first husband had to pull me to the floor to stop me. She spun round, flinging her arms above her head and letting out a long hoot like an owl. How can you stand there when there's music, Kitty? Dance with me. Oh, you couldn't. Come on. Mrs. Steinberg grabbed Kitty's wrists and pulled her away from the stove. She pressed her thighs into the backs of Kitty's legs and leaned back, taking Kitty with her. Now forward. With the other woman's arm around her waist, Kitty bent forward. Now hop. They hopped on the spot. Now back. Now hop. You've got it. Haven't you made lunch yet? Jeanie was standing in the doorway. It's almost twelve o'clock. Honestly, darling, sometimes you're so conventional. Will the world end if we don't sit down for lunch at half past twelve on the dot? The record had finished, but Mrs. Steinberg was still dancing, swaying back and forth before her daughter. The potatoes aren't even boiling, are they? Jeanie tapped her foot. Her mother stopped dancing. And what do you know about potatoes? The girl looked directly at Kitty. I watch Kitty when you're not here. She lets me watch. Mrs. Steinberg took Jeanie by the shoulders. You can watch me now, then. You can watch your mother do it. Her high voice was dangerously even and clear. Look, Jeanie, I'm doing it. Your mother's doing it. Mrs. Steinberg reached across Kitty, picked up a cutlet by the bone, and held it in front of her daughter's face. A drip of blood fell through the air, landing on Jeanie's bare toe. The girl seemed to have frozen in position, her mouth skewed in disgust. Her bottom lip began to tremble. Kitty raised her voice. I should really get on with those now, Mrs. Steinberg. The woman let out a long breath. Our lesson has been ruined by my daughter, I'm afraid. We'll have to do it another time. 
Mrs. Steinberg? Yes. Kitty hesitated. Her mistress's nose was inflamed, her mouth pulled tight. But if she said it now, she might get the answer that would give her an excuse. Uh, could I have my evening off on Friday this week? Friday? I really need your help on Friday, dear. Mr. Crane's sister is coming for dinner and I can't cope by myself. I hope it wasn't anything important. Oh, no. Nothing important. heat haze was distorting the beach. A greasy shine had settled on the sea, which swelled lazily forward, then back. Mr. Crane, who was striding ahead across the sand, turned to face her. Glad you could come, Kitty. Glorious sunshine, isn't it? Perfect day for an outing. Kitty hadn't thought she'd any choice about coming. But she nodded and smiled, trying not to look at the exposed base of Mr. Crane's neck. "'Here comes trouble,' he said, turning back to face the girls. "'What's in your bag?' Jeanie asked Kitty. "'Embroidery, miss.' "'Are you good at it?' "'Yes, miss, I'm quite good, but mostly at dresses and that.' "'Does that mean you could make outfits?' "'Yes, I suppose so, miss.' "'Could you make me and Diana Piero outfits?' Uh, "'I suppose I might.' Ellen, shouted Jeanie, Kitty's going to make us Piero outfits so we can do a proper show. Kitty unpacked the hamper. That morning she'd ironed and folded the checked tablecloth, washed out the flasks with bicarbonate of soda, wrapped the game pie and the fresh poppy seed cake, and polished the silver cake forks. Mrs. Steinberg eyed the food. No scotch eggs, Kitty. There was a glint in her eye, but Kitty ignored this. If the woman had given her more than a day's notice, she would have been able to make both the scotch eggs and the poppy seed cake. I didn't have time in the end, Mrs. Steinberg. Mrs. Steinberg uncorked a bottle of wine. Collecting the glasses together, she filled each one with red wine, spilling some of it on the sand. Kitty, girls, have a drink with us. I have an announcement to make, and I want you all to have a drink in your hand. Mr. Crane gripped his knees. An important announcement. Glass in hand, she knelt by Mr. Crane's deck chair. In fact, it's our announcement, isn't it, George? Diana moved closer to her father, dropping her slice of pie as she did so. Only the meat was left. The girl had eaten all the pastry, the jelly and the egg. There was just a blob of pink pork with a hole in it, looking up at Mrs. Steinberg. Mr. Crane was staring down at the nibbled pork. Very exciting news, Mrs. Steinberg tossed her head back. There'll soon be another person joining our family. Mr. Crane passed a hand across his mouth. A toast, please. Kitty lifted her glass. To our new baby. Mrs. Steinberg tipped the wine to her mouth and swallowed, her throat contracting. No one else drank. The girls were staring at each other. Mr. Crane stood his glass in the sand and got up. Excuse me, he said. I think I need some... He walked towards the sea. Diana scrambled to her feet and followed him. Biting her lip, Mrs. Steinberg reached for the bottle and refilled her glass. Isn't it wonderful news, Jeanie darling? The girl ignored her mother and raised her face to Kitty. Will you still make me a Piero outfit? She whispered. Kitty nodded. I promised, didn't I? The girl gave Kitty a weak smile. Mrs. Steinberg drained her glass and filled it again. The two girls stayed up for hours, whispering, discussing the day's events and what to do about them. We could say I'm very, very ill, Dinah had suggested. Gravely ill. That might stop them. How? I could pretend to have an awful disease. Then Daddy would have to take me home, and they could never get married. And your mother would have to... 
She put her lips close to Jeanie's ear. Get rid of it. It wouldn't work. You'd have to pretend for ages, and in the end they'd get a doctor and find out, Jeanie said. I suppose they might not get married. Diana shook her head. If there's a baby, my father will marry your mother, and I'll never get home to London. We'll both be stuck here in the middle of bloody nowhere forever. I know. Kitty. We'll say Kitty's having an affair with my father. Then your mother will throw him out, I'll go back to London, and your mother will have to, you know, not have the baby. But Kitty isn't having an affair with your father, is she? I know that, really, Jeanie, you're most awfully literal sometimes. We'll have to pretend, like in a play. How? It'll be easy. It's a perfect, perfect plan. Jeanie had never seen Diana look so happy. It was the morning after the picnic, and George had announced over breakfast that he was taking the girls to see the bee orchids on the downs. They walked behind him, holding hands, shoulders bumping together. You two are very gleeful today, said George. We're happy, Daddy, about the new baby. Back at the cottage, Ellen was sitting in her nightgown at three o'clock in the afternoon, and she could smell her own skin in the heat. Burying her nose into the fleshiness of her upper arm, she reflected that Crane hadn't really touched her since their al fresco encounter. On her lap was a folder marked Personal. James's letters to her, letters from just over a year ago. She picked up the last one from the top of the pile. I will stop drinking, darling. I know I have promised before, but now I am away from London, all that madness, all that pressure to perform, I do feel I can do it. It's partly for the physical pain. Whiskey seems to be the only thing that stops my blasted ankle hurting. But that will change when I've had the operation. She long suspected that her daughter knew. Jeanie must know, surely, that James's death was her fault. Her daughter would have heard the terrible row the night before the operation. James had been drunk again, and it was just after she'd first slept with Crane. She'd snapped and thrown her tumbler of whiskey at him. James had brought back his hand and slapped her like a child. What she'd felt was relief that finally he'd done it just as she'd always known he would. She'd gone to bed, knowing he would sit in his study all night. She'd never thought, not for a moment, that there would still be enough alcohol in him to react so badly with the anaesthetic. It simply hadn't occurred to her to mention it to the anaesthetist the next morning. Sitting at her desk in this strange little house in the wilderness, she felt it was entirely her fault. At half-past seven, she managed to comb her hair into some sort of shape, dust her nose with powder without looking too closely at the evil thing in the mirror, and put on her cream silk dress, all without crying. George's sister Laura, who had come to stay with them, was already downstairs. She must go down to the dinner, instructions for which she'd left scribbled on the back of an envelope last night. Kitty, tomorrow's dinner menu. Pea and lettuce soup... Chilled poached salmon and new potatoes. Strawberries. Has everyone finished? Crane stood and began to collect the bowls. What on earth are you doing? demanded Ellen. Uh, clearing the table. Kitty's had a lot to organise this evening, and we always said we didn't want her waiting on us. Ellen bit her lip. Kitty came in with the salmon. It looked passable. Its eyes still firm, its skin lightly crisped, garnished.
with parsley and lemon. Using a fork and spoon, she peeled back a strip of silver to reveal the rose-coloured flesh beneath. Pass, please, please. Have you told Aunt Laura the good news, Daddy? Diana was looking at her father with a bright face. Crane's eyes met Ellen's. He looked very tired. We'll tell Aunt Laura later, he said firmly. Tell me what? Whisper it to me. I love secrets. Crane put a hand on his daughter's shoulder. Yes, it is good news, actually. I've been offered some work with the party. Lecturing. As soon as Ellen plunged the knife in, she knew the fish was overdone. There was no give to the flesh. It was dry. And when she lifted a slice and dropped it on Crane's plate, it stood absolutely still. And where will you be lecturing, Crane? He was helping himself to potatoes. All around the country. You'll be travelling. Quite a bit, yes. And when were you going to mention it? I thought now might be a good time, seeing as Diana brought up the subject of good news. I'll be speaking to the people about the importance of politics in great literature. The importance of politics in great literature. That's right. And what's happened to the great literature you're supposed to be writing? Crane began to dissect his fish. The novel is not as important. His voice was low and steady. This is real work, work that can change the way things are. Ellen snatched Crane's plate from the table. Don't eat that! She began clearing everyone's plates and cutlery. In fact, don't eat any of it! Ellen, it's awful, ruined. I'm going to have to do something about that girl. She can't cook anything. She never could. Crashing the plates down on the table, she shouted, Kitty! Crane put his hand over his eyes. Kitty, come here, please! Ellen, don't. Kitty! There was the sound of a door slamming and footsteps along the corridor. Kitty appeared in the doorway, her face flushed. What have you done to that poor fish? Kitty's mouth moved, but no sound came out. It's ruined! She couldn't help yelling. Absolutely ruined! What did you think you were doing? The point is to cook it, not kill it. There was a loud bang as Crane smashed his fist on the table. Ellen, not here, not now. Why not? It's my house. I want to know what the stupid girl thinks she was doing. She stepped closer to Kitty. Do you think I didn't know you weren't a cook when you first came here? Do you think I couldn't see right through you? I gave you a chance, and this is what I get in return. Bloody incinerated fish! Kitty was staring at the floor. Crane went to her. Kitty, he said softly, you can go now. We'll talk about this in the morning. I did like it said in the book. They all looked up. Kitty was staring at Ellen, her chin trembling, but her eyes fierce. Mrs. Steinberg? Madam? I did it how it said. Crane put his hand on her elbow. You can go now, Kitty. Take the rest of the evening off. Just like it said in the book, Kitty said again before turning to go. Kitty had been sitting on her bed for at least an hour when there was a knock at the door. She stayed very still. If the woman was coming to start on again about the bloody fish... Another knock. Quite a light knock. A bit of hesitation in it. Then there was a voice. Kitty? It's Mr. Crane. May I come in, please? Thanks. He stood for a moment, looking round. Look here, he began. I, uh, sorry it's a bit late, but I thought... She waited. You see, Ellen, uh, Mrs. Steinberg, is a bit out of sorts at the moment. I'm sure you'll uh, understand. He sat down heavily then, right next to her on the bed. I want you to know that I'm very pleased with your work, Kitty. He stood up, making the bed springs creak. Are you going? As soon as she'd said it, she put her hand to her mouth. I'd better get back, see what the others are up to. It didn't seem to get cooler any more, even at this time in the evening. She could smell the sweetness of his sweat.
George's daughter, Diana, and Ellen's daughter, Jeannie, began rehearsals for their play right away in Jeannie's bedroom. Diana had appointed herself writer-director. There was no time to waste if her plan was to work. Now, it's a one-act play called What the Gardener Saw. You'll be the housemaid, Ruby, and I'll be the great poet, John Cross. Jeannie lay on her bedroom floor and looked at the ceiling. Can't we do another play? Diana slowly walked around her friend before leaning over and looking into her face. You get to kiss me. Jeannie giggled. It's hopelessly romantic. I'm struck by the thunderbolt, you see. What thunderbolt? The thunderbolt of love. You're kneeling on the floor, scrubbing, like this. And I, the great poet John Cross, come up behind you, and when I touch you, I think you should swoon. I can do that. Go on, then. Jeannie closed her eyes and let her body buckle. As she went down, Diana caught her, pulling her close. When it came, the kiss was dry and hard, and both girls stayed completely still as their lips locked. Finally, Diana came up for air. Very good, she said a little breathlessly. I'll tell Daddy that we have a play to show them on Friday morning. It was early evening when Kitty got back to the cottage. She'd spent her afternoon off on her sister's sewing machine, running up the costumes she'd promised to make for the girls. Although it was almost dark, she knew immediately that someone was in her room. Kitty, forgive me. Hearing his voice, she dropped the Piera costumes to the floor. She snapped on the light and he flinched. What do you want, Mr. Crane? Quite. What do I want? What do I want? Have you been drinking? He lifted his head. Kitty, he said, and his voice was suddenly loud and deep, as if he were addressing an audience. What I want, what I like very much, is for you to sit here beside me for a minute. He looked at her for a long moment, his eyes steady, his face pale and thin in the electric light, and Kitty knew she'd have to do as he asked. She was shaking as she sat on the edge of the bed, her stomach pulling inwards as if a thread were being gathered inside her. She felt a sudden urge to laugh as he moved closer, but then his face was in her hair, his lips on her earlobe, and the thread in her stomach snapped, and everything came loose. Sometimes the kisses were long and light. At other times he kissed her so hard she felt his teeth on hers. Eventually he lay back on the counterpane and said, Come to bed now. It was late by the time Ellen returned from town with half a dozen bunches of Kana lilies on the back seat. Getting out of the car, she groaned to herself as she noticed Crane waiting in the front porch. She made for the door, but he blocked the way and clutched her arm. Ellen, please. His voice was low, his face grey. I need to speak to you. She laughed. <laughs> you haven't needed to speak to me for the last few days. I don't see why you should start now. It has to be now, but not here. You're hurting my elbow. Come for a walk. You know I loathe walks. Do you? You never said. They crossed the field. Broken ears of wheat poked at Ellen's feet through her peep-toe shoes. There's no baby, Ellen, is there? The possibility of lying to him flashed into her mind. But how much time would that buy her? No, she said. There is no baby. Then I think we should part. It's been a year since...
James died. I'm going to leave as soon as I can. Ellen gripped a handful of grass, pulled it from its roots and tossed it into the air. <laughs> what have you been doing all summer? What do you mean? Well, you certainly haven't been writing a novel. No, I haven't. Well, it has all been a waste of time, then. Of course it hasn't. I've been getting ready, preparing myself for important work for the party. Oh, so that's where my money's been going. The development of those damn Bolsheviks. <laughs> and there was I thinking I was a patron of the arts. He reached for her hand, but she snatched it away. Ellen, I read the letters you've been typing, the letters James wrote to you. I know how much you loved him. Oh, you don't understand. I feel so guilty. Ellen, you shouldn't waste time with guilt. After all, we didn't do much, did we? Until after his death, no one could blame you for getting on with life. She turned to him. You don't understand. I knew he was still drunk. I knew it, and I didn't tell them. I let them operate, give him anaesthetic while he was still full of whiskey. Crane stared at her. Do you understand? It was my fault, George. James's death was my fault, and Jeannie knows it. Jeannie loves you, he said. She loves you, Ellen. Suddenly there was an immense pealing of church bells. Thursday practice had begun. The chimes rose and fell, scattering sound over the village and echoing around the valley. Oh, damn those bells to hell, she said. He squeezed her hand. I'm so sorry. After a few minutes, she said, I'd better get back. It's dinner time. The girls will be waiting for me. On Friday morning, Jeanie jumped from her bed to put her costume on. The girls were to perform in front of the rose bed, now in full bloom. The adults were sitting in a row on kitchen chairs, set out on the parched lawn. George had his hands behind his head and a smile on his face, but his eye was twitching. Kitty's cheeks were very pink. Diana ran towards them with a twirl and a bow, and everyone clapped. And now for our play, written by me, Diana Crane. Ladies and gentlemen, what the gardener saw. This is Ruby, the housemaid, and I am the great poet John Cross. Falling to her knees, Jeanie began to scrub the grass. Diana stepped behind her. Who is this wondrous creature? What beauty there is to be found in a lowly housemaid. I am inspired as never before, inspired by love. Jeanie heard her mother's high-pitched laugh. Kiss me now, and then I will declare my poem in your honour. Diana's hot breath was on Jeanie's face as she lunged forward for the kiss, her eyes wide and bright. Do not resist me, maid. I am struck by the thunderbolt. Jeanie heard her mother's high-pitched laugh again, but it was quieter this time. The lawn, the sky, began to wobble. She looked towards Kitty, who nodded and smiled encouragingly. She thought about Kitty, and about the costumes she'd made them. She thought about the times they'd been in the kitchen together, when Kitty had given her bits of pastry to play with. And she thought about Diana's plan to send Kitty away. There was a long pause. And suddenly, Jeanie could see what she had to do. She pushed her hands into Diana's chest. No, she said. One kiss is all I ask. Summoning all her strength, Jeanie shoved Diana away. Leave me alone, she shouted. Diana stood, staring at Jeanie, and then turned to their audience. The end, she panted, bobbing slightly. Kitty decided she'd pretend nothing had happened. That evening, she'd made a quiche, as she'd now learned to call it, and put aside a slice for herself. But although the bacon was crisp, the pastry softly crumbling, and the cream and egg filling shivered on her fork, she didn't swallow more than three bites. She watched the glow of the lamp grow in George's studio window. 
It was past ten o'clock when she made up her mind what she should do. There was no time to waste. Unbuttoning her apron, she changed into a clean pair of knickers, the ones with the lace trim that she'd sewn around the legs herself. She tiptoed through the kitchen and out into the night. God, Kitty, he said. They were both frozen for a moment. Then Mr. Crane pulled her inside his writing studio and slammed the door closed. Kitty, I I'd been meaning to talk with you. Uh, look here, it's the most awful timing, but uh, I have to go away tomorrow. It's a lecture tour, you see, with the Communist Party. Very important work. Damned awful timing. But I have to take this opportunity. She began to shake. And it's really very exciting. This country's going to change. Everyone says so. The working classes are going to rise up. How long have you known? Some weeks. She covered her face with her hands. Where's Kitty? Jeanie yawned. Diana spread the toast with butter, being careful to get it in all the corners. There's no baby, you know. Jeanie had almost forgotten about her mother's announcement. Isn't there? Daddy told me yesterday. Jeanie nodded. Then she asked again, Where's Kitty? Haven't seen her. Jeanie watched in silence as Diana ate two more slices of toast, thickly smeared with raspberry jam. The door opened. It was George. Five minutes, Diana, darling. We've got to catch the 8.40. Kitty was too exhausted to cry any more, but she wasn't refusing to get out of bed. It was just that she didn't see why she should. Mrs. Steinberg was sure to throw her out soon enough. There was a knock at the door. Kitty! It was Jeanie's voice. Kitty? She waited for the girl to go away. Ellen says, will you have lunch with us? So that was it. Even now they couldn't make themselves a meal. Can't you get your own lunch just for once? She was almost shouting. Mrs. Steinberg was standing at the stove, stirring something. It's only scrambled egg, the woman said, frowning at the stove, ploughing her wooden spoon into the pan. Well, you can make up for it tomorrow, Kitty, I'm sure. But for now, we'll have to put up with my effort. I helped, added Jeanie, hopping on one foot. I cracked the eggs. Kitty folded her arms across her chest. I'm not dressed. <laughs> what does that matter? Mrs. Steinberg was dolloping mounds of egg onto plates. Sit down and eat. Kitty could tell by the way the egg fell with a heavy splat that it would be rubbery. The toast in the rack looked limp and cold, but her mouth watered. Taking a chair, she sat at the table. In just a minute, Mrs. Steinberg disappeared from the room. Kitty looked at Jeanie. The costumes were lovely, the girl said. Then the cottage was filled with the thump and soar of music. Mrs. Steinberg returned. Much better.